Thank you very much for uh, uh, the invitation to give this talk, uh, Vincent and the other colleagues. I, I don't know uh, most of you, but uh, I'm happy uh, to be uh, to be here. Um, of course, it would have been better to be face-to-face uh, uh, -face in the same room, but uh, I hope uh, since, uh, uh, as far as I understood, all of you will go to Japan, uh, maybe uh, uh, Keio and University colleagues uh, can uh, organize some bus trip to Tsukuba, uh, where I am now, so uh, near Tokyo. And as, uh, as Vincent said, uh, I am um, actually associate professor in a French university, so in Amiens, it's in the north of Paris, and uh, particularly in a robotic perception group uh, in a slightly more general lab, but where uh, we are interested in um, uh, vision for robotics. To, to say it shortly. And since 2019, uh, I am also a CNRS uh, delegate. So CNRS is the National um, Research uh, Center in France, but in Japan, because I am in the International Research Lab named Joint Robotics Laboratory between CNRS and AIST, AIST in Japan, which is also a, a, a national uh, research center. So today uh, I will uh, give uh, an overview of some research I, I did, so uh, mostly uh, in France, but uh, uh, some, uh, some new works down also uh, in Japan. So of course, uh, this, uh, this presentation is just a few slides. So if you want to know more, uh, you can access to my website to get uh, 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 the papers or directly contact me, uh, of course. So one of the context with which uh, I would like to start is uh, the, the interest of perception for robotics. So usually we think about autonomous robotics, but there is also assistive robotics uh, to help people, for instance, to uh, uh, drive uh, vehicles. So wheelchair can be considered as a vehicle. And actually it's hard uh, for most of the users. So usually there is a training period to learn how to drive this kind of uh, chair or wheelchair. Uh, particularly, as you can see uh, on the left, uh, to go in complex, complex spaces. And of course, if the user is uh, impaired, uh, the complexity of driving the wheelchair is harder and harder. So vision and uh, other tools, of course, uh, can be a, a good tool for them to uh, improve their mobility. So in the research I'm doing, uh, we are particularly interested in visual perception and also non-conventional vision, let's say uh, vision with non-conventional field of view. So in this slide is just uh, uh, image captures to show to the user, but with a slight augmentation of uh, these images. So you can have uh, an idea uh, with a sketch at the center. So the user has a, um, a screen um, that is showing images captured by 360 degrees camera. So it's camera that you can buy uh, yourself. Maybe you already know. Uh, its particularity is it has two uh, sensors and two uh, fisheye lenses uh, pointing to uh, opposite ways. So uh, forward and backward, for instance. And the raw images are acquired as dual fisheye images. Fisheye because the lens is, uh, the name of the lens is a fisheye, so very wide uh, field of view. And a dual because we have uh, uh, the two different uh, orientation. Of course, this is not so nice to display to a, a user. Uh, Maybe a specialist, is, it's okay, but for any user, it's not so nice. So uh, the geometry of this camera is uh, estimated by calibration. So I'm sure you will uh, deal a lot with the uh, calibration issues, uh, even without cameras uh, during the master. And then when uh, this kind of camera is calibrated, we are able to transform, to change the shape of the image uh, in order to display uh, easier to understand images. So really in the center, uh, I don't know if it's very clear, but in the center with some uh, uh, user interface, it's a uh, uh, full view, uh, the spherical view, but displays as an equi, what we name an equi rectangular image. So 360 degrees uh, horizontally, 180 degrees vertically. But of course, even this one, it's not so nice. So we can again change, uh, uh, transform this image to another space. Uh, which is here uh, slightly uh, easier to understand, quite close actually to what we have in some cars. 
uh, to help uh, uh, park, uh, car parking. And you can see some uh, uh, green and red lines that are actually uh, some measurements, proximity measurements made around the, the, the wheelchair, so around the user. Uh, with the so proximity sensors, or in this case, it's uh, sonar sensors, but uh, we also did some things with the uh, time of flight sensors. So a variety of sensors that can be used to uh, add information uh, on the image in order to help uh, the user to uh, uh, drive the wheelchair. So we are uh, developing this in a, in a project named uh, ADAPT. So it's a project, uh, international project with the uh, with United Kingdom. And uh, currently, so the, the evaluations are, are ongoing, but, uh, but mainly uh, the, the goal is to be able to show that this kind of system can help uh, people drive the, the wheelchair. Uh, mainly, uh, the, so we don't know the conclusion yet, but uh, uh, mainly uh, the backward motions are the most, uh, the most interesting. So in this case, even if there is no autonomous robot, uh, there is already uh, uh, image acquisition, uh, calibration, transformation, slight augmentation, and an application which is a more uh, visual feedback for, for a user. But even uh, with this kind of uh, uh, non-autonomous uh, system, uh, the images that are displayed can be uh, quite uh, uh, of, low, of low quality, let's say. Uh, because in, in, if we consider uh, outdoor, the environment uh, where, of course, you have the, the sun and uh, when you, you drive, so the camera is a bit different, but uh, the ID is similar, very wide field of view. Uh, we have a different lighting of the uh, environment. So here in streets of uh, the city of Amiens in France, at the bottom, you can see a little bit of the famous cathedral, to, about which we work as well, but uh, I, I'm not going to talk about this today. Uh, anyway, depending on the position of the sun, uh, some areas in, in the image is uh, uh, correctly uh, uh, visible. Some others are quite dark and others are uh, very bright or uh, completely saturated. And this is an issue uh, rising directly at the acquisition time. So for this, for instance, uh, recently, we uh, uh, developed uh, a new sensor, so it is a bit more complicated because it, it, no, it does not have only two fish islands or one mirror, but four mirrors. But it allows, thanks to uh, adding, uh, you can see on this uh, in the circle, adding some uh, well-chosen neural, neural density filters, um, the, cap the capability of uh, 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 acquiring images of various exposures simultaneously. And then uh, the raw images are, again, hard to understand for, for a human, but uh, uh, when we combine them uh, with a high dynamic range fusion algorithm, uh, we can get an image where every pixel, despite at the sun, is uh, correctly exposed. So the color is uh, uh, understandable. So uh, I think, uh, yes, this, this is recorded, so you, you will be able to access to, to the video. I, I want to, to keep uh, the, the time. So uh, this, this uh, new sensor, we used uh, it uh, recently uh, for direct visual surveying, which is this time um, an autonomous uh, control of the robot. Uh, and using uh, this new sensor, we could show that uh, the, the robot, the mobile robot, can be driven from uh, farther distance uh, to the goal compared to uh, uh, not using this system. And I want now to uh, detail a little bit how uh, we can drive the robots, uh, mobile robot or other robots, from pixel brightness directly, so considering all uh, information in the image, and uh, later in the smaller second part, uh, how to use the similar ideas, but to estimate uh, the Um, so here there are a lot of uh, keywords. So what we name direct visual surveying is uh, the use of uh, the brightness, pixel brightness directly. So direct 
for visual servoing. And visual servoing is another word for vision-based control of uh, robots. So here I show you an example, which is quite old now, but uh, it uh, gives a quite good idea uh, on, a, on a gantry robot on the, uh, to the right. So at the top, we have uh, uh, actually a fisheye camera, which is attached to uh, the end effector of this robot. And it captures this kind of image. So uh, again, wide field of view. Uh, here we are in grayscale, but uh, anyway. And actually, uh, another image was acquired before at And the difference between both is uh, giving information to the robotic system to uh, uh, drive the robot from the current pose to the desired one. So in a few words, uh, it's really uh, the difference uh, pixel to pixel, which is uh, minimized or try to be regulated toward zero uh, by controlling the robot motion. So here we have six degrees of freedom three translations and three rotation. Uh, there is an intermediate step, which is uh, not always necessary, but here it's used, so it's displayed on this sketch. But uh, once the, velo the desired velocity of the camera is computed, it is transformed thanks to, thanks to inverse kinematics to the uh, 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 robot uh, joint velocity uh, in order to uh, really move the robot. And at the end, you can see that the difference between the current and the desired image is uh, almost perfectly uniform. So it means the uh, camera reached the same location as the desired one. And in this case, the visual measurement is only acquiring an image. There is no uh, image processing despite computing image gradients. So there is no feature extraction, either handcrafted or learned. And at the end, since uh, almost every pixel are matching, uh, the the accuracy is uh, submillimetric. So actually, it's below what we can measure with this uh, quite old robot now. And uh, more recently, uh, we wanted to uh, reach uh, similar results with uh, more conventional cameras. So actually, on the previous slide, the motion you could see was quite big at that time, like uh, uh, four times what we could obtain with a conventional camera. Uh, some previous work did uh, two years before by another team. And um, what we wanted to, to add in order to increase the, what we name the convergence domain, so the, the, the volume uh, in which the camera can start uh, to reach the desired pose on the desired image, is using blur, which is not so common usually we want to avoid blur uh, to have at least uh, some precision or accuracy and this time uh, we propose the method uh, that is uh, blurring a lot the images and it, it leads to uh, an enlargement of this convergence domain um, this method is named photometric gaussian mixtures uh, i will talk again uh, later about this but uh, in short, uh, the idea is to start the visual surveying with a large amount of blur uh, to, to remove actually all the details and also all of the local minima. And then near the convergence, near the desired pose, uh, we decrease suddenly. So there is a, a switch in this uh, control law. We decrease suddenly um, the amount of blur to uh, retrieve the same accuracy, the same precision as before. So still some millimetric precision. And by this, uh, so there is a, a little bit of, of uh, mathematics behind some uh, uh, partial derivatives and Jacobians and so on to, to be computed. But uh, uh, in, in a few words, uh, this ID uh, allowed to reach similar uh, convergence domain than with the wide uh, field of viewer camera. And uh, so th these, these works, I did them uh, before coming to Japan. And uh, recently, uh, I wanted to keep going on this idea of uh, blurring the images to uh, have a large convergence domain. So I wanted to, of course, uh, as always, uh, uh, have a larger, uh, even larger convergence domain. And I thought that uh, there is um, of course, various uh, uh, source of blur in images, even optical blur. And uh, one of them is the defocus blur. Um, in a few words, uh, so if we uh, consider this uh, detail of a picture, 
uh, depending on the lens we use, if we can open wide the, the aperture of, uh, of the, so it's a mechanical setting uh, on the camera. Um, depending where the, uh, the depth of focus is set, uh, we may have the same, we may capture the same image, whatever the, almost whatever the, the, the setting of uh, this aperture is. But as soon as we change the position of the camera, so if the aperture is uh, quite narrow, uh, we still acquire sharp images. But as soon as it's quite wide, uh, the blur will appear when uh, the scene is not at the depth which is in focus. So this is what we uh, often have when we take pictures with our own camera. Uh, the interesting thing is the amount of blur varies depending on the distance between the current position of the camera and the one at which we set the uh, depth in focus, which is in our case, we choose uh, this setting for the desired image. And so basically we, we, we from optical, uh, just optical uh, uh, characteristics, we, we would have exactly the same as before, but with a smoother evolution of the of the blur there is no switch from a large blur to a smaller blur and from the equations uh, all these direct visual savoings uh, method uh, rely uh, on uh, uh, quite basic uh, uh, criterion to minimize uh, there are others but most of them are relying on this criterion is the as i said before but here uh, better formalized uh, the pixel to pixel difference between uh, brightness and this uh, this control law uh, the control law sorry to minimize this uh, this uh, this criterion or this cost uh, we can uh, uh, express it from uh, some assumptions uh, the first one that was used at, at the very beginning so uh, is uh, the brightness consistency consistency assumption this is even coming from uh, uh, works uh, in the 60s and uh, assuming that uh, a pixel gets the same brightness or whatever the orientation or the position of the camera is, uh, allows to uh, derive uh, another constraint, which is the optical flow constraint equation, uh, where we can see uh, some uh, variation of the position in the image, so x dots and uh, nabla i, which is the gradient, image gradient, so the horizontal and vertical uh, derivative of the image. So things that we can uh, compute. I will uh, talk, uh, get back to this uh, later. Uh, with the defocus blur, uh, of course, since I just said before, when we move the camera, the amount of blur varies. So this uh, uh, brightness consistency assumption uh, no longer holds. Actually, the brightness becomes inconsistent. And uh, this can be represented by uh, a convolution with the uh, uh, normal Gaussian kernel. So I don't know if you already know all of these, uh, these keywords, but it's again some uh, quite uh, well-known uh, uh, process. And we, by deriving this uh, equation, we uh, lead this time to the focal flow constraint equation. So the writing is a bit different compared to the left, but uh, uh, to the left of the approximately equal sign, it's actually the same, but the right side is very different. So when we don't have the, uh, 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 the, the varying brightness, of course, the varying part is zero, but when we have the varying brightness, it's not zero. And it's depending on some parameters, so the depth of the scene that is observed, and some, uh, uh, this time, delta i, so some uh, uh, image processing, like Laplacian, Laplacian of the image, uh, so der deriving twice the image uh, that we can compute only from the image. And when we use this, uh, by linking the motion in the image to the motion in space, we can uh, compute or express the control law, which is V equal uh, uh, what you can see on the slide. So the pseudo inverse here of, of, the, of the Jacobian matrix, which is uh, expressed with more details uh, to the right, which is nothing but a, a rewriting with the matrix, matrix, matrix form, sorry, uh, of the above equation. And by, by doing this, by implementing this on a, so on a real robot, a universal robot 10 here, uh, you can see on the left side, um, putting the camera on the wrist of the, of the effector, which is a, here a gripper, but not, not used in this video. 
Um, so you, you have an idea uh, of the distance between the desired and the uh, initial pose of the camera uh, held by the robot. And to the right, you have the images acquired at the desired, the current, and uh, the difference between the current and the desired uh, images. And despite starting from uh, very far, uh, even farther than before, uh, the difference between both images can be minimized from uh, uh, quite large distance, which is the maximum that is reported now in the in the in the literature for uh, uh, cameras of this uh, kind of field of view. And uh, so the, the error is uh, smoothly uh, minimized, and at the end the uh, precision is still the uh, submillimetric precision. So I, I won't detail all the equations, of course, uh, for all the methods I'm going to present. But uh, on one example, I wanted to uh, give a, a bit more insight of uh, what is behind. Uh, next, uh, uh, sorry, why is it not moving? OK. Next, uh, the idea, uh, one of the idea uh, uh, after this, sorry, is to encapsulate uh, this kind of uh, uh, visual summary, direct visual summary in a slightly higher level navigation algorithms, uh, not only uh, moving from uh, current pose to a desired one, but to uh, navigate to a path, path uh, following a path. So a path defined by a set of images, uh, each acquired at uh, intermediate desired position. And um, not only this, but also we can plan the path. So the geometry of this path in order to uh, uh, ensure that uh, we can indeed uh, follow the path. I mean, the system, the, the robot can follow the path. So here it's an example with the robot arm. And uh, again, so it's smaller than, than before. Um, uh, actually, uh, the, the planning algorithm uh, that is used is uh, uh, exploring a space of possibilities. And when uh, there is uh, no strong difficulty, as we can see uh, on the left in the nominal case, uh, the path that is computed is almost uh, a line. But as soon as uh, we remove uh, here to, to show clearly the things, uh, we remove a part of the environment, the algorithm will uh, adapt the path. So we'll plan a new path in order to uh, uh, ensure that enough information is uh, uh, captured by the camera to drive the robot from the initial position to the final, but uh, not with a straight line in this case. Uh, that was a preliminary work for uh, a robot, uh, a flying robot navigation system. So relying on the same ideas of uh, uh, building a sequence of image that is a kind of visual memory of the path uh, through which the robot should, uh, should drive. So very similar ideas. But this time applied on the flying robot, so we had a lot of issues to make the uh, real-time control of the robot because also we wanted to use a, a common platform, which is a, a, a drone that you, you can buy. So maybe this one is uh, discontinued now, but uh, new newer ones you, you can buy it uh, from Parrot, and uh, with the transmitting the image is. Uh, captured by the onboard camera to the ground, uh, computing them, uh, computing the velocity uh, that the robot should apply from them, sorry, and then transmit uh, to the robot the, uh, the velocity. So just saying it, it's quite long. So you can imagine that uh, there are some delays in the transmission and so on. So there are a lot of difficulties be behind this, but uh, for quite a uh, 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 quite large, actually, uh, uh, distance between uh, uh, successive images to to travel uh, to. Uh, this system could could work, so uh, it still uh, it has still some some improvement. But at least we could uh, um, have a kind of proof of concept that uh, it's possible not only to plan but to follow uh, this uh, visual path by uh, a flying robot. And uh, ju just to, uh, to, to, to go back in, in, in the central idea of uh, getting the widest uh, convergence domain of uh, direct visual suffering, uh, in this time, uh, this robot, this flying robot, could uh, drive, um, to, could correct an error only from uh, pixel uh, intensity uh, differences that is equivalent to 3.5 meters uh, in space. So it was a quite, quite interesting result. 
Uh, now I want to move to, to the second part. Uh, now you, you have an idea of uh, how uh, we can link uh, the pixel brightness variation to the position of the robot, uh, the variation of, this, of the position of the robot, sorry, the velocity of the robot, uh, taking the same ideas uh, uh, for localization. So to estimate the motion. So the localization is quite a, a large, uh, large field uh, and uh, um, at the, at the so it's a large field and usually the result of a long pipeline of processes but um, from in the vision community uh, the one of the first step is to do uh, what we name visual odometry so it's the estimation of a motion between the successively acquired images and so this was done in uh, you can see here by other works in 2013 from pixel intensities directly uh, but uh, existing works uh, can quite uh, nicely estimate the motion between uh, two consecutive images where uh, there is no strong motion no strong interframe motion but as soon as the motion is slightly bigger uh, they fail even if uh, they uh, consider not only uh, uh, color camera, but uh, color depth or RGBD cameras, uh, combination of uh, color measure and depth measurements. So recently we wanted to, uh, to have success for these methods, uh, even if there is a large interframe motion. So um, we considered uh, scale space representation of the image, so which is a, a kind of, uh, transformation of the image, but in uh, uh, several layers uh, space uh, represented a, as a pyramid of resolution. So the idea of pyramid of resolution is maybe from the 1950s. Uh, and usually uh, we uh, divide by two the resolution, uh, apply the alignment algorithm on the lowest resolution, take the result to initialize the alignment algorithm at the uh, better resolution just above and so on until uh, uh, the finest resolution. And uh, in, in this work, uh, we actually uh, change a little bit one of the parts. Uh, so we keep uh, the, uh, uh, the resolution, which is uh, 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 how to say, uh, uh, the ratio of resolutions between two successive uh, 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 stages in this pyramid. But actually, we add, uh, maybe from the previous work, you can imagine, you, we add some blurring effect, <laughs> which is uh, actually equivalent to uh, uh, making uh, continuous uh, the evolution of the scale of the image, still in the course of fine alignment process. And uh, so the writing is slightly uh, different, but the main idea is still the same, pixel to pixel differences. We add one uh, parameter. Uh, so there is not only the geometric parameter, but also this scale parameter. So one more parameter, which is controlling smoothly the evolution of uh, uh, the amount of blur. So as we could have, for instance, with the optical blur, but here by image processing. And when we look at the evolution of this uh, parameter, so it's a bit uh, technical, but uh, we can see uh, on the green curve that on the blue curve, sorry, that first uh, the evolution is smooth. And at the coarsest level, the interesting thing is uh, this algorithm is able to increase uh, this uh, value, so to increase the amount of blur in order to enter the convergence domain, even if the uh, number of levels it was maybe not enough uh, for a, a quite strong motion in this example. Uh, that is uh, quite different uh, compared to uh, uh, previous methods where uh, you, you, you did not have this uh, smooth evolution uh, that would even increase. Uh, and so when uh, switching from one um, stage to the other in this one level to the other in this pyramid of res resolution uh, there was no continuity at all between uh, uh, the two stages and the interesting thing is uh, uh, the estimated motion so uh, looked at uh, uh, larger not, not just uh, uh, on uh, estimating uh, the motion between two successive image images but for uh, some trajectory uh, is improved. So uh, to the right, uh, there is in black 
the ground truth, so the real uh, or the measured differently uh, in a different way, a trajectory of the camera. Uh, in red was the result of the best method before, and in blue is the result when we consider the continuous evolution of the scale among the resolution levels. So the blue uh, estimated trajectory is uh, much closer to the ground truth compared to the red one. So again, it shows uh, quite good interest of uh, direct approaches uh, in terms of accuracy. Uh, this was known before, I mean the accuracy, but uh, now we can uh, even have a quite strong motion uh, that can be uh, uh, corrected uh, with this kind of estimation. The next step is uh, uh, to consider uh, not uh, the motion between two successive images, but uh, the alignment of the captured image with a 3D model of the environment. Because sometimes we don't need to create uh, the 3D model because uh, there are already a lot that are available and maybe we want to reuse a previous one. So in, in this case, uh, we have uh, to the left uh, 3D model, which is a 3D point cloud uh, 3D RGB, so 3D point cloud with a color pair of 3D point, um, in order to be able to render uh, virtual images uh, that are of the same shape of the acquired images. So in this work, it's again a, a wide uh, field of view camera with a mirror. And one of the needs actually to uh, uh, implement um, the, gain the blur, the amount of blur control in the alignment between the captured image and the 3D model is to deal with uh, some areas that appear quite easy. So in the street, uh, there is a, a sideway, a sidewalk. And uh, when the robot needs to cross the, the street, now there is a, a, a slight uh, difference of uh, height. So maybe uh, one or two centimeters, but uh, for a small robot like this, it leads it to shake a lot and a big differences appear between uh, uh, successively acquired images. So uh, the, the idea is uh, still the same. We have a desired image, which is the acquired one this time. And the current image is a rendered image. So uh, uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but uh, above IR, it's written rendered. And uh, the, this image is rendered at an initial pose, uh, which is usually the optimal one of the previously acquired image. And the difference between both, so this time the modality is slightly different, but the difference between both would be uh, minimized to optimize the 3D pose of the virtual camera. And at the end, at convergence, um, the, the, the pose of the virtual camera is the same as the one of the real camera. Of course, if the real camera is uh, well calibrated. This is the case here. And uh, so we can see uh, the, the, the path of the, of the virtual camera uh, is not so straight uh, sometimes, but in this case, it's not a, a big deal because uh, it's only a virtual camera moving in a virtual world. And uh, even if we have a strong, uh, strong uh, uh, displacement between the two successive uh, images, uh, the alignment is, uh, is possible. So actually, uh, to, to quantify a little bit uh, the, the strengths of the displacement between two successive images, uh, we dropped some of the images in order to increase this, uh, this, uh, this distance. And uh, up to one meter, in this case, uh, the alignment was uh, possible. Um, to show it on larger, uh, uh, larger experiments, uh, we consider the the lar larger part of the 3D model of uh, the city and uh, put uh, camera on top of, uh, of the roof of, uh, of the car, of a car, uh, acquire a set of images and uh, uh, rendered uh, at first from, in this case, a manually set uh, pose of the, of the camera. And then the, minim the, the difference between both is minimized by optimizing the 3D pose and so on and so on and so on. So you can have here uh, a result of, so the, the left video is the acquired one and to the right is rendered the image at the top and the difference between uh, both at the bottom. And of course, there are slight differences in the images because the 3D model have uh, uh, things uh, that are actually it's the, the opposite. The reality has things that the 3D model has not. 
but despite this, the estimation is uh, successful and accurate on uh, several hundreds of meters, um, even like more accurate than a basic car or GPS, for instance, uh, because uh, in some French uh, streets, uh, they are very narrow and uh, the buildings, they are not very high, but enough to uh, uh, be a, a difficult situation for, for GPS. So on the right, actually, the, the, the red curve is uh, the trajectory the, of, uh, measured by GPS crossing some buildings. And uh, in pink is the one that is estimated by, uh, by the tracking. So which is uh, in the streets and not uh, crossing uh, some uh, buildings, which is, uh, of course, not, not what we need. So this is just uh, applying this uh, tracking. Uh, so sometimes, of course, it won't work when there is not enough information. So it's the case uh, here at the end of this trajectory. Of course, uh, it's one algorithm as uh, previously uh, the estimation in uh, of the so the visual odometry, the estimation of the motion between two successive images should be uh, integrated or encapsulated in uh, uh, another set of uh, algorithms to deal with this kind of uh, issues um, another another detail is uh, i show you an evaluation uh, uh, of the estimation which is qualitative uh, evaluation because we we have uh, some gps uh, data but uh, they were not acquired in synchronously with the captured images so it's hard to uh, compute uh, the metric distance uh, between the, uh, the, the, the the estimation and okay the GPS data. I won't call it uh, ground truth uh, this space. So we uh, also worked in uh, building uh, uh, data sets uh, because it's quite useful to to evaluate uh, quantitatively uh, uh, all these uh, algorithms of motion estimation. Uh, of course, as uh, you may understand now, I, I'm interested in why the field of view cameras. So we considered uh, 180 degrees cameras and uh, full view cameras, uh, not only on mobile robots, uh, but also on uh, robot arm and flying robot. And uh, so we, we also uh, considered, sorry, uh, not only uh, 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 urban environments, but a kind of mix between, uh, so at the border of the city, so a mix between the urban environments and uh, uh, so it, it's not the it's not the forest here. Uh, you can see at the bottom right, but the but uh, some so, some park, uh, at least where you have natural uh, uh, trees and, and and so on. So, so uh, we, we we share this uh, this. Uh, this uh, this data so maybe uh, later in your research work you, you will use them uh, please uh, uh, i encourage you uh, but i wanted to uh, uh, continue uh, a little bit with uh, uh, these uh, 360 cameras so these uh, cameras of uh, full view uh, uh, capabilities uh, that are on the flying robots acquiring uh, this kind of uh, image so it's a uh, quite a loop compared to uh, what, uh, what, uh, with what I started uh, with the with the wheelchair. So using the same kind of camera, but this time on the on the flying robot, on a flying wing. And the inter interesting thing for uh, uh, estimation algorithms is, in this case, we have an image that is uh, uh, providing information in every uh, direction in in the full. That, that's why we name often is the full view or the spherical view uh, around the viewpoint, so the, the position of the camera. And then uh, it gives uh, the ability of a global convergence domain, uh, considering pure rotation, for this, uh, uh, these uh, alignment methods based on uh, the brightness of pixel. So this time, uh, we will again use uh, these ideas of uh, blurring the images uh, smartly so controlling the amount of blur uh, to have a large convergence domain but uh, accuracy at convergence uh, since the image is a bit different uh, we that, than the than the conventional ones we need to adapt uh, the way we represent uh, how uh, the geometry of the image is uh, is uh, uh, executed so how 3d point projects in the image through uh, one spherical representation 
uh, but two image planes. And then once this uh, dual fisheye image is uh, projected on this sphere, uh, on this sphere, sorry, uh, we uh, blur it uh, by computing. Uh, so phrasing is a bit different, but it's still uh, some blurring effect. So here we name this uh, mixture of photometric potentials, but it's still with uh, some Gaussian representation. And by doing this, uh, after blurring this uh, spherical image, so again, uh, uh, we compute the difference pixel to pixel. Uh, and here, since we acquired uh, quite accurate, uh, very accurate, I can say it, uh, a data set, we can have uh, the plot of this cost, of this uh, criterion, let's say, uh, with respect to uh, each angle. So the, the camera was uh, mounted on the robot and the vector. Uh, precisely uh, calibrated and rotated uh, almost degree per degree. So we can compute this cost uh, without any, uh, any outer uh, uh, perturbations, uh, only this cost with respect to uh, the degree of freedom. So here is just one, one axis of uh, rotation on this plot. And uh, wh when the setting uh, of the amount of blur is, uh, is the best one, we uh, move from a convergence domain that is uh, at first between, uh, let's say, minus 60 degrees to 60 degrees, so uh, 120 degrees, to uh, the full uh, convergence domain, so 360 degrees in, in this case. So we, are, we also consider the, uh, the pure rotation uh, around the, the three axes to, uh, to validate uh, the same ideas uh, and to show that the convergence domain is extended and there is also some good robustness to, to translation. So we did pure rotation. I mean, the robot did pure rotations around the camera optical center, but from uh, different positions and try to align uh, uh, the, the, the captured image with the reference one, which is at another position. So despite uh, this translation and assumptions of pure rotation, uh, the alignment was uh, very good. At least uh, the minimum was at zero degree. Uh, the drawback, because there is uh, often some uh, trade-off to consider, uh, if we want to retrieve the same accuracy uh, as uh, before, we need some extra processing time because the, the resolution of the image on the sphere should be um, quite high to, to retrieve, to, to, to get uh, this uh, sub, uh, so in this case, it's not sub millimetre, it's sub degree uh, precision. Um, so we applied uh, the, 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 the alignment algorithm, so uh, optimizing, optimizing this time only the, the, the 3D rotation, not, not the translation, but the 3D rotation by minimizing the difference between uh, spherical image, so at the bottom represented here as an equirectangular image, acquired at the center of uh, uh, the area covered by a flight. Um, taking every other images of this flight. So when there is no correction, uh, since the, maybe the, the, the flying uh, uh, wing uh, was, uh, I don't know here, maybe uh, uh, moving to the right. Uh, so there was some, uh, some uh, roll angle. Uh, you, can, you can see that uh, the, the, the shape of the horizon is uh, really not straight. It's uh, quite uh, curvy. And if uh, the rotation can be estimated between the reference image and the current. It means that, that we can compensate, we can transform the current image to a space which is close to the reference image one. And this is what uh, uh, could be done. So of course, the shape of the drone of the flying uh, uh, robot is not the same in the image because uh, well, it's not the same uh, uh, orientation in space, but uh, the rest, I mean, the sky, uh, so, it was in the north of France at that time. It was quite cloudy, but we can have an idea of where the sun is. And at the bottom, the crop fields are well aligned too. So this is an example, but the, the flying wing was driven for, for about five minutes, I think four kilometers around, and moved, of course, from the ground. So you can see here, when the corrected image is circled by green, it means the correction is, is, is working. Uh, sometimes it's, it's not working, so it's circled by, uh, by red, but uh, 
you, you can see that uh, sometimes it succeeds for very strong uh, uh, rotations. And uh, so we can have a look at uh, the entire video, but uh, to, to, to sum up, uh, the correction is a successful 88% uh, of the flight with considering only one image as a reference image at, at the center of this uh, flying area, uh, which is about, uh, there is no scale here, but it's about uh, 400 meters times 400 meters. So maybe uh, the maximum distance between the reference image and, and the, the farthest one is about two, 200 meters. So it shows uh, the, the robustness to translation. Um, in this case, uh, I mean, in the case of the flying robot, uh, it was quite hard to get uh, as we could have with the robot arm or the, the, the mobile robots, uh, the synchronized uh, data, uh, uh, like synchronized GPS data with respect to uh, each image. So we recently uh, uh, considered another uh, platform, so quite, uh, quite bigger one uh, with the six rotors. So it's not a it's not a wing this time. It's a, it's a exarotor, and uh, on which we can embed uh, more things, uh, particularly a, a computer, uh, to be able to deal with these uh, synchronization issues. And we could uh, build. Uh, so we have just a capture on the right, uh, a set a data set where um, we have uh, for each uh, dual fisheye uh, images uh, the GPS pose, and uh, because we want to evaluate. Uh, uh, orientation estimation algorithms. Um, the outputs of the, the inertia measurement unit, units, so the roll and pitch angles, and we have also the yo uh, of the of the of the flying robots. So with this, we will be able to to compare uh, 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 quantitatively uh, the estimation. So to conclude, uh, I wanted today to give you a, an overview of uh, how we can use directly pixel brightness to either, either control the robot motion or to estimate its motion with a camera. Uh, as I said, uh, it's not the, the, it was not the first works, but uh, quite a contribution of uh, an existing area where we already know that uh, the accuracy was millimetric and uh, quite useful for scenes of a uh, few features. But now with uh, these uh, works, uh, we could show that um, there is some robustness to large motion, uh, both in the image space and uh, in the 3D space. And also uh, it's quite efficient with the scenes of large radiance, since to the design of uh, new sensors. So there are, as usual, uh, some, uh, some uh, still some work to do. Uh, I did not uh, detail a lot uh, this part, but uh, uh, the trajectories of the robot are not always uh, very good uh, in terms of uh, straightness. So we have uh, ongoing uh, works on this. And also uh, the, so for the robot arm, uh, particularly, the, the, the dynamics is not so high. So uh, we are also working on this. And uh, since now I am uh, in, a, in a robotic team where, uh, humanoid robot is uh, uh, quite uh, uh, at the center of the research and uh, where well, the team is very famous uh, worldly. Uh, of course, uh, the idea is to work uh, uh, with humanoid robots. So we already did the uh, things, but with the uh, industrial partners, so they, they want uh, us to be uh, quiet on the, at least for the moment on the, on the results, but on the, the manipulation of uh, the, big industrial objects, kind of bobbin. Uh, so the robot works and uh, drive the, the, the big object uh, simultaneously. And also to uh, uh, estimate accurately the pose of some object in order to grasp it uh, uh, correctly. Uh, we also uh, developed uh, other works uh, currently with uh, some colleagues at the University of Tokyo about event cameras, so another type of camera. Uh, that is not uh, capturing uh, images as usual, but uh, variation of intensities, variation of, uh, of brightness. So if this kind of uh, works uh, can, can interest you, uh, I, I don't know if uh, uh, the colleagues from the University of Keio uh, will let you uh, go out, but if you want to have a look at what we do at AIST uh, in Tsukuba, uh, you will be uh, really, really welcome. And now if you have any question, of course, I will be happy to, to answer. Thank you. 
Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Guillaume, uh, for this very nice presentation. So uh, now we have time for a round of uh, questions. Uh, so feel free to to ask if you if you have any question. Okay, so so maybe I will start the hostilities <laughs> by asking some <laughs> questions. Uh, uh, Guillaume, in your presentation, um, uh, you are mainly dealing with uh, um, static scenes in which you don't have a lot of moving objects. Uh, uh, how are you dealing in, a, in the scene with moving objects or dynamic environments? Are you developing some approach in this way? So the, maybe the most dynamic uh, experiments uh, we did is uh, when we put the camera on the top of the car because it's in the real city, so we don't manage uh, the, the environment uh, around. Uh, so with the orientation of the camera, uh, I, I mean, the image we capture, uh, we, we don't have the, maybe you can have a, a bit of the head of uh, pedestrians, but we don't have a lot of varying uh, things. Uh, we have a little bit, uh, either. Um, and mostly, uh, currently, we, we deal uh, with this by uh, uh, robust estimators, so rejecting uh, the, the data that is not matching the model, let's say. It's not, okay. that, it's not rejecting uh, uh, completely, but uh, giving some weight uh, uh, to uh, uh, trustable the uh, pixels and uh, lower weights to uh, uh, the others. Okay, okay. Yeah. See. And, uh, Maybe if, if you can just add, add one thing, uh, another, uh, so there, of course there is the dynamic uh, scenes, uh, but also when uh, the, the sun uh, uh, changes, I mean uh, positions and also with, with clouds, it's uh, even in static scenes, uh, uh, it leads to quite uh, strong changes in the, in the visual aspect of the scene. And uh, that's also why we, we, we designed uh, some, uh, some sensor to, to, deal, uh, to deal with this. Okay, okay, I see. And um, uh, maybe a second question about um, uh, when you talk about the application of um, um, wheeled chair, um, mm -hmm. uh, how you make the, the embedded processing uh, for your approach? Is it, uh, uh, I would say, time consuming or are you the designing your approach to be to have less uh, processing? Or do you embed specific hardware like GPU or something like that? No, for, for, for this, uh, I mean, the, 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 the hardware is, uh, is, uh, is a Raspberry Pi uh, and the processing is uh, not so strong because we don't, uh, with the wheelchair uh, right now, we don't control the robot motion from the, from the image. So it's just, the image is captured, there is a transform of the image and it's uh, displayed, uh, it's almost just this. Uh, and, and all of this is uh, de developed within some uh, ROS uh, environment. Um, when cur currently, uh, we we don't really uh, uh, work on the specific hardware. Uh, I mean, wh when we do experiments of controlling the wheelchair uh, from images, uh, we use a, a laptop computer uh, uh, which is attached to the to the wheelchair. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, yes, okay, please, I see one question in the chat. So, uh, yes, Isaac, go on. All right. Uh, my name is uh, Zeke. I'm over with uh, ECN in France. Um, I did just post in the chat, but I wasn't sure if I could speak or not. And Basically, my question was, uh, did you ever try mechanical camera stabilization, specifically for um, the earlier Parrot drone uh, and or um, the street navigation robot? I know you had mentioned that there were some troubles with it uh, climbing up the, 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 um, the curb that had a couple centimeters and the camera would wobble, or with the drone, how, you know, for a drone to uh, to fly, it's going to tilt, and therefore the camera isn't pointing towards the ground anymore. Yeah. So for, for the first drone, uh, we used the uh, we used the so it's not a mechanical uh, stabilization, but actually uh, the it was 
Parrot uh, Bebop 2. Uh, it acquires a fisheye image and takes a subpart uh, as a perspective image. So it's kind of virtual uh, gimbal, uh, virtual uh, stabiliz stabilization. So we used it um, uh, for the, the others. Uh, we, we don't, uh, yes, indeed, we, we did not use uh, uh, actual mechanical uh, stabilization. But it, yes, uh, it can help, clearly. Thank you. Okay, thank you. A any other um, uh, question? I have one quick question. Yes? Mm, I was thinking, do you have any other alternative to fish eye, fish eye cameras for these technologies? Because the fish eye camera like, takes quite a big space in, the, in a car, for example. Um, so the, the there are there, there are some uh, lenses uh, which are smaller than uh, than the one we we used. Uh, depending on the mount, also uh, I mean the attachment of this uh, of this lens uh, on the on the camera on the camera board. Uh, the the other option we used uh, is uh, using mirrors, but uh, it's I think it's the opposite way because it's quite uh, bigger than uh, than uh, using uh, fisheye lenses. Um, well, uh, other other solutions are to 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 use multiple cameras, but uh, again, uh, it's uh, bigger than uh, using uh, a fisheye uh, fisheye lens. So, well, it's 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 hard to be uh, smaller. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, uh, maybe um, one more question. Well, one of Two more questions. Yeah, I do have a small question. Yes, yes, please. About, about uh, the mathematical approach used. Um, usually you said that you used the difference in uh, pixel, like the gradient. Is it possible to use something related to the uh, homogeneous matrices or something like this? Because that's what we usually see in computer vision uh, courses, or that's what we saw at least. Like a difference between homogeneous matrices with the position of the arm, the, the actual position, and the desired position. Yes. So, um, um, so here uh, we we don't measure the homogeneous matrices, so that's why we we use pixel brightness because the camera measures pixel brightness. But uh, these uh, homogeneous matrices, so the frame change uh, from uh, uh, maybe the robot base to the to, to its uh, to its end effector, is used uh, in the in the Jacobians of the the robots uh, for for the for the control for the control loop. But but it's not uh, yes, it's not the difference, uh, let's say, or the distance between two two poses or two uh, homogeneous matrices, because we don't, uh, at least in the control part of my presentation, we don't estimate, we don't compute uh, the 3D pose of the camera or the 3D pose of the end effector. So we don't have uh, we don't have this data. We just uh, uh, think as uh, velocities. Um, of course, uh, if we use uh, more the second part of our presentation where we can retrieve the 3D pose of the camera with respect uh, to either a 3D model or another image. Uh, then you, you can use it as uh, any other source of uh, uh, information or source of uh, uh, 3D pose as input of your uh, classical control law. And, and some, of, some works, uh, maybe not very recently, but uh, Several years ago, we, we named this uh, 3D visual servoing or position-based visual servoing. So the, the vision is used to estimate some 3D uh, pose. And then the pose is the input of the control law. OK, thank you. OK, uh, uh, thank you. One more question. Okay, uh, great. So uh, thank you very much again, uh, Guillaume.